Our Old Testament lesson today comes to us from Isaiah chapter 65, verses 20 through 25. Again, that's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 20 through 25. If you need a second to get there, please feel free to pause this video and give yourself the time. And when you're ready, go ahead and start. Hear the word of the Lord as I share it with you. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will, enjoy, will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Our New Testament lesson today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, that's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. 1 Peter 2. 4 through 10. Take a second to get there, pause for as long as you need to get there, and then resume whenever you're ready. Hear the word of the Lord as I share it with you. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May God bless to us and to our understanding this reading from his word. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you have given us the story within the Bible to tell us what has happened and what is going to happen to give us hope for the future, to, to let us know that you have not left us alone, that you have called us to be your people, precious in your sight. We forget that, O oh God. Open your, uh, open your word to us. Open our eyes to your word that we would see what you have for us, our ears to hear your word, and our hearts to understand what it is that you are saying to us this day. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, wherever we are, whenever we are, be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I want to start out by asking you to do a little experiment. Uh, and if you need to take a little bit of time to do that, that's great. Go ahead and try if you want to try it a little bit later. Or if you want to imagine what this might go like in your head, go for it. Uh, here's the experiment. And, I, and I'll let you know too, 
This is CDC approved. It follows all social distancing guidelines, so you are not at risk here. Uh, and un done under the correct supervision, it will not spread any illness. So you're entirely safe in doing this. There's no excuse not to do it. Here's the experiment that I want you to do. How long can you go without sinning? How long can you go without sinning? And, and just to limit it down here, let's run with uh, the Ten Commandments. Just ten. Just ten simple commandments. How long can you go without breaking one of those commandments? Well, I don't know about you, but I, I don't know how long I would actually last in that experiment. Um, in fact, there may be some of you that may be thinking, I blew it before I, before I rolled out of bed. I blew it before I got to the fridge. I blew it uh, before I even said hello to my spouse or to my kids or before I got on the phone or what have you. Uh, but you may be thinking, I, I don't know that I would last too terribly long. Well, uh, what we find out as we are talking about this grand narrative of the Bible, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, we're now getting into the redemption part. We're, we're moving from the fall and we're saying, what hope is there? How is it that we get from this broken, fallen slate, state and how do we get some semblance of hope back into our lives? And what we find through scripture and throughout the story here, and there's a great deal of scripture, the middle large chunk of it, that is dedicated to showing us that it's through Christ that our relationship with God is redeemed. Through Christ, our relationship with God is redeemed. Well, we need to take it back just a little bit and talk about uh, something here. Uh, because after the, uh, the story of the fall, it doesn't take very long to see what happens. In Genesis 6, uh, 5, we see God, right before the story of Noah's uh, comment, that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination had become uh, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's a pretty frightening thought, uh, and it's a and it's a pretty bold statement at that, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. But I don't think that it's too far of a stretch to really imagine that. Uh, we look for, Mr. Rogers is famous for having said, in the difficult times, if you need hope, look for the helpers. There are always helpers. And the reason that we have to say that is because we do imagine both so much going wrong and people taking advantage in difficult times. Even times like these, we can see where people are doing the wrong things. The, we have to be warned about scams and people that are going to use this, this time to try to steal personal information and credit cards and bank account information, who are going to try to sell products at vastly marked up rates uh, that, uh, you know, if, if it weren't for Amazon taking down some of these sellers, some people would sell toilet paper at exorbitant rates. Every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. And we realize that, that that's not too far of a stretch. So what does God do? God gives us the law to show us holiness and how far short of that holiness that we actually fall. Let me say that again. God then gives us the law to show us holiness and to show us how far short of that holiness we have fallen. 
you know, the law was given to Moses uh, on the mount, and, and, and it shows us that we don't measure up. What it is, is it's a moral mirror. It shows us, we think, if we don't have a mirror, we can think we look pretty good. I don't get really frightened in the morning until I get in front of the mirror, and then I get really frightened. In the same way, we can think of ourselves as not looking all that bad unless we have something to, to look into that shows us just how bad we are. And that's what the law does. And the law, it, to clarify, the law doesn't just have don'ts. It doesn't just say, you shall not do this, you shall not do that. It, it does that. Hear me on that. But it also says, you should do this. Take care of the poor among you. Make sure that no one falls into debt too far that they can't get out of. Restore property to them. Help them out. Look after uh, the powerless. Make sure justice is done. Make sure that people get a fair shot. And so there are lots of good, positive do's in the law, in amongst all those don'ts. And you have to wonder, well, well why would God have to... We, we tend to think of, of the law as this big list of things that we shouldn't do. It's a big restrictive, uh, big restrictive thing. God's going to cancel all our fun. God is going to, re to quarantine all fun through the law. But it, like I said, it's not just that. It's do these wonderful, good things that we should be doing. Take care of people. Look after people. Make sure they're fed. Make sure they have a fair shot at life. And why is it that he has to include that? Well, the reason that we realize when we think about it that we have to have both the do's and the do nots in the law is because we can't do it ourselves. We can't do it ourselves. If we are left to our own devices, we are not going to do the positive things. We're, we're not going to, to avoid the, the evil in the world and we aren't going to do the good. We're going to, to take advantage of both sides of that. And so we can't do that ourselves and we need the law to show us not only can you not avoid evil, James, but you can't do good either. You can't do any of it. And we realize how far short we fall. We realize how little we can do. We, can, we realize how far short of a holy God, a perfect God, we fall. When, when put up, up against perfection, we don't measure up. We don't even begin to measure up. And that's what the law helps us to see. Yes, it helped to, to train us in what to do and what not to do, but it also is that moral mirror that shows us exactly how bad things are. Exactly how scary in the morning we look morally. And so the question, once again, in this series is, you know, what's the hope? Or I should say for this particular question. You know, where did we come from? That's creation. What went wrong is the fall. And what hope is there? And at this point, you may be saying, James, you're you're not giving any hope. You're, you're telling us that through the law, we don't really have any hope, do we? And well, okay, fine, you're right. That's true. That's why we have our first Peter text from today. And what Peter illustrates uh, is that Jesus takes the dead weight of our broken lives. Uh, in, in places in Paul, Paul says that we are dead in our sins. We're dead in our trespasses. And Peter tells us that Jesus takes the dead weight of our lives, of our broken lives, and rebuilds us into a holy temple, a living temple. Let me ask you this. What do you think that you could offer to God that would be an acceptable gift to him? 
if you had to look around your house, if you had to look around your life, if you had to look around everything that is available to you and figure out something that would be an acceptable gift to God from you, something that would measure up to his holiness, something that would be acceptable and not tainted by sin, what, what would you be able to give? Well, our, our opening question pretty well reminds us, and the, and the discussion on the law reminds us that everything we do is tainted by sin. There isn't anything that we attempt that isn't tainted by sin. And, and it, we can say, well, I, I, can, I can do this, and I can, I can do this, and I'm not sinning when I do this. And we try to separate out this idea of, of us being people who commit sins versus realizing that we are sinners, that everything we do is tainted by sin. And we have to come to that, that realization so that we can fully understand the depth of our redemption. What Peter says here, when he talks about we are a, a royal, a, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, when he says that we are able to offer sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, what he's telling us is that when we offer our lives, as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, our service, our possessions, our worship to God is offered then on the basis of Jesus' life, Jesus' action on the cross, Jesus' holiness, Jesus' righteousness, and not our own. When we believe in Christ, we are able to offer things back to God, not as, as individual people who are sinners, but as people redeemed by Jesus Christ. And we are able to approach God. We are able to approach a holy God. That, that is, I'll put on my best Boston accent for this one, game changer, game changer, game changer. Uh, and so the question becomes, if we understand this, if we understand Peter's word to us, that as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. How would you live, then, if you understood this deep at your core? How would I live if I understood it deep in my core, that I were, was able to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God because of what Jesus Christ has done? How would you live? How would I live? Instead of realizing that, instead of thinking that it's my own action tainted by sin in everything I do, that it was Jesus' righteousness that would shine, shine through. What is it that you would try? How is it that you would live? How would you step out in faith knowing that Christ would Im infuse his holiness, his righteousness, into your actions, into your attempts to serve God? God. You know, I've been thinking a lot recently about how is it that the church's actions of serving people during this time differ from any other attempt to, to bring some sort of hope, some sort of happiness into people's lives right now. And this text has, is really convicting on that. This text really shines light into the fact that it, we're trying to do something on our own. We're trying to do something that we can say, hey, look, I made this person feel good. Hey, look what I did. And, and what Peter tells us is that because of Christ, we no longer have to look and say, is someone looking? I did something all right but that we can look and God accepts our service as a spiritual sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him. 
that is substantively, qualitatively different than me trying to feel good about I made someone's day brighter. My hope is that their day is brighter because they understand who they are in Christ. They understand that God loves them and that they are complete through Jesus Christ. And, and that's the other takeaway in this, that through Jesus Christ, we become characterized once again by our relationship with God. I, I mentioned in the, in the early sermons, and if you need to go back and, and revisit those, please do, that in the beginning, in creation, we were characterized by our relationship with God, by the image of God that dwelt in us, that God specifically put in humanity that was not given to the rest of creation. We were defined by that special relationship with God. And through Jesus Christ, we become characterized by that relationship once again. We see it in, in that second half of what Peter says, that we are a chosen people, chosen by God, a royal priesthood to God, a holy nation of God's, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful life. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. We're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession and receivers of mercy rather than judgment. All of this in definition, our lives in definition and in relationship to God's. We're able to worship him once again, and we're able to have a relationship once again where we fulfill the role that we were created to fulfill. We are, we are not rulers in our own right. We are not mere dust, but we are God's chosen people, precious to him, special to him, a prized possession, if you will, a royal priesthood, people who receive God's mercy, knew every single day, not because of the weather, not because we're alive, but because God loves us, that we are people of, of mercy. And Lent and Easter remind us of the sin that was rightfully ours, but willingly taken by Jesus. The, the practice of repentance during Lent. I'm not wearing any purple. I'm not wearing my stole or my robes. That would be terribly awkward. Um, but this is the time when we have, if you could imagine the sanctuary, the purple banners up. Uh, my robe would have the purple stole on it. Uh, and we would have the, the purple um, cloth is draped across the cross. And purple in the church is a reminder to repent. It's a call to repentance, a, a, a special time of focusing on renewing our relationship, on repenting of the things that we have done, and to, um, to seek, turn from our ways and seek God. And uh, that's the special purpose in, in the Lenten discipline. And we are reminded in examining our lives, not of how bad we are, but in, in some ways, yes, of how bad we are, but of how much we have been forgiven. Because, yes, the sin that was on Christ was ours. That was our punishment that he took but he took that willingly. This is how we have our restored relationship. He took that willingly. It's not a, a kind of game over, insert another quarter, try again, do over, but it is a conscious decision, a willing decision on Jesus's part 
to bring us back into relationship with God, to redeem us, to restore us in that relationship. And even though we still feel the effects of sin, we still feel the effects of aging, of death, of, of disease, of sickness, of uh, a, a difficult relationship with one another, a difficult relationship within ourselves, as we talked about last week, a difficult relationship with the creation. Uh, the, the decisive victory is there through Jesus. So we still feel the effects, but that decisive victory is there. And we start to live into our original identity. I'm not talking about when we were born. I'm talking about at creation. We have to start living into that original identity as people created in God's image to work and to reflect the triune God the God in community, in perfect relationship with himself throughout all eternity. We're to reflect that, start reflecting that in our life. And first of all, in our relationship, in our vertical relationship then with God. It changes our status. We're no longer sinners deserving of the wrath of God, but we are God's chosen people his prized possession, his special possession. People who receive his mercy. And we now have to start living that way. We start living as people who bear that identity once again. And it's difficult. Let me say that's going to be very, very difficult because we were born into the identity as sinners. And so we need to work on this identity as chosen people, as royal priests, as a holy nation, as God's special possession, as receivers of mercy. That's going to be difficult. That requires us to, to, to understand that change of status in our own lives. And so as, as we come to the end of, of this time together, let me ask a more pertinent question. Because the question of how long are you going to la uh, uh, how long can you go without sinning is really a moot one the question that i want to ask is this how will i live as a member of god's chosen people a recipient of god's mercy think about the four areas that we have talked about. First of all, primarily, our relationship with God. What does that mean in our relationship with God, that, that I'm now his special possession? How do I worship? What are the things that should concern me when I worship? What are the things that I bring to worship? What are the, the, the ways um, what are the considerations that I have in worship, knowing that God is going to tie up the loose ends and is going to accept that as a spiritual sacrifice? How about with each other? What, how will I live as a member of God's people with those around me, knowing that I can try to live out and reflect community knowing that God will tie up those loose ends. How is it that I need to treat myself? How is it that I need to approach the relationship with myself then as God's special possession? That will be one that we get into a little bit next week. And then how will I live in relationship with the creation as God's special possession, as someone who bears his image as someone who has received his mercy and wants to reflect that into creation as well. These are hard questions, and they're not questions that I'm going to expect you to have an answer to right now. If you have some thoughts, and this is where us being the people of God is a helpful thing, if you have thoughts, put them into the comments section 
of this post so that we can share with one another. We can share ideas and help to build one another up and help to know how we can start to live as people who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, as, as people who are God's chosen people, recipients of God's mercy, his holy nation, his royal priesthood, his special possession. I keep repeating those, not because I don't have anything else to say, but because I think there's an uncomfortableness with those phrases. We haven't lived into that identity, and that's part of what we need to do. We have to be, start becoming comfortable with the, our identity being those things. This is our challenge for this week. We, we begin to get into redemption and it's a good thing, but it's also a reminder that we have a lot of territory to cover. It's redemption isn't a light switch that flickers on, flicks on, and all of a sudden everything is right. It is a process through which we are put into a right status and then we begin to live into that status. And so if it seems like there's a bit of difficult work yet to be done, there is. We were born into an identity as sinners and we're starting to live into an identity as God's chosen people. It's a difficult work, but I'm interested in hearing how you're doing that, how you, uh, how you can see that in relationship with others, with yourself, and with creation. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you have put us into a right relationship. That through your son, Jesus Christ, we are once again bearers of your image, able to offer worship to you rightfully and rightly. Help us to live as your people. Help us to live into this identity as your chosen people, as your special possession, as your royal priesthood, as receivers of your mercy, as people who have been spared your judgment. Help us to know what that means. Help us to, to consider that in every aspect of our lives. It's a difficult and lifelong long work, O oh God, but it's a wonderful one, knowing what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. We give you thanks. We offer you this, our worship, this day, knowing that you accept it because of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.